We're in a series called Resilience, and it's not so much about bouncing back because that sounds like uh, going back to the way things were or we used to be, but how do you move forward when life kind of knocks you down? And so we're in Philippians, the third chapter. We're going to talk about what big picture living looks like. And this is what the Apostle Paul says. He says, not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself, what's the next word? If you've got your notes, you just might want to circle that word, yet. To have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, Forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. When you look earlier in the chapter, Paul had been living with a certain picture of himself, and he describes it. He tells us that, first of all, he's an Israelite, so he identifies as ethnic group. And then in, the, uh, in Israel, there were 12 tribes. So he identifies which tribe he's from. That's from the tribe of Benjamin. And then he tells us that he's a Hebrew of Hebrews, which means uh, he's considered very prominent. And in terms of his denominational affiliation, he was a Pharisee. Just like there are Baptists and Methodists and Presbyterians and Lutherans today, there were Pharisees and Sadducees in different ways of approaching spirituality back then. He said he was a Pharisee. As for zeal, he was so zealous that he actually felt he had a license to persecute others who disagreed with him. And he said, as for righteousness based on the law, he was faultless. That's a pretty strong uh, and bold statement to make. And yet, for a guy who had lots of confidence in his heritage, in his connections, in his example, he wound up discovering that that picture of himself was far too small to lead him into a fruitful future. Then one day he met Jesus on the road to Damascus. In that conversation, Jesus gave him a glimpse as to what his life could be like, and it was a much bigger picture than anything he had seen so far. And as a result, he was never the same. In fact, he would go on and he would experience a, a fair amount of suffering and adversity but this picture was so compelling and so bold and so faith-building that he thought that anything he had to go through was worth it because he knew that God was greater than anything he was facing and God was going to do great things through him. What's interesting is that all through Scripture you see this happen to person after person. So we need to think through, how do I know if I have a big enough picture for my life? And uh, here's what I want you to know this morning is that uh, every season of life kind of comes with a different set of questions. So if you don't know, 20-somethings ask themselves a different set of questions than 60-somethings. How many are surprised by that? This is very different. L let me give you some examples, all right? 20-somethings. <clears throat> the questions they'll be asking themselves are, are kind of like this. How am I different from my mother or my father? Where can I find a few friends that I'm going to uh, navigate life with and they're going to provide a family-like connection for me. Can I love deeply? Am I lovable? 20-somethings are coming to grips with the fact that they're, they're not adolescents anymore and so some of the stuff they used to get a pass on or get away with, that's not working so well. So they have to make some changes. And they're asking themselves, what can I build my life around? What can I build my life on? Then you move into the next, day, de next decade, which is the 30-somethings. And in the 30s, you start taking on a lot more responsibilities, but you don't get any more time in your day. It's just how that works. And so you start having to work through, how do I prioritize the demands on my time and schedule? because there's spouse, and there's children, and there's career. There's all these things that I have to attend to. And how far can I go in fulfilling my purpose in life? It's kind of on the front end of that, and you have a lot of energy. Who are the people that I'm going to walk through life with? Because after you start getting out of your 20s, by reason of marriage and careers, a lot of people we've had close connection with start relocating, and you can feel dislocated. 
And then what will my spiritual life look like with all the demands that I'm trying to juggle right now? And, and, th and then this is one of the questions 30-somethings will ask. Why am I not a better person? They assume that they would have been able to fix some things by now. They're a little surprised they have it. Then you go into the 40s. I know nobody here is in the 40s, but something to look forward to when you get there. Suppose uh, you're supposed to have figured some stuff out by the time you got in your 40s. And you're supposed to be a little less fearful and a little more confident. But there's a series of questions that starts forming in our minds and we start thinking about. For example, who was I when I was a child? What was I like? And what forces in my life have helped determine how I have turned out or who I have become? Those, those questions begin to, to uh, dominate some of our thinking. And why do some people seem to be doing better than I am? That's a question in your 40s you start asking. Or why am I so often disappointed in myself or in others? Why does it seem like I have more limitations than options? By the way, by the time you get into your 40s, your bodies start to change. Not for the better. And children start becoming more independent, even if they're home. And marriages have to make some adjustments. And, and sometimes in 40s, we start giving up on life -giving, uh, lifelong goals and ambitions. We just think it's, it's not going to happen for us. And some people in their 40s, they miss their youth and they try to recapture it, which almost always goes badly. <laughs> and then there's this question, why am I so uncertain? Because by 40, a lot of people figured that they would have some stuff figured out. Why am I so uncertain? In fact, the word that is most often used by people in their 40s is a single word called trapped. Trapped. Then you move into your 50s. And uh, you start asking questions like this. How many productive years do I have left? <laughs> and uh, what ambitions and goals have I had that might not be very realistic? Why is time moving so fast? Wasn't it just Christmas yesterday? And here we are, past the 4th of July. Why is my body becoming unreliable? How do I deal with my failures? How do I deal with my successes? How can, how can my spouse and I reinvigorate our relationship? Who are these young people that want to replace me? And why do they know more than I do? What am I supposed to do with my doubts? What am I supposed to do with my fears? Will I have enough money for retirement? Tough set of questions. Then your 60s. I know some of you are wondering, how long is he going to go? <laughs> Till I get every person in the room. <laughs> In the 60s, you start asking questions like this. When do I stop doing the things that have always defined me? When do I stop doing the things that have always defined me? Why do I feel ignored by more and more people? What do I have yet to accomplish? Do I have time to do some things that I've dreamed about? Who will be around me when I die? If you're married, you'll start asking yourself this question, which one of us is going to go first, and how do you say goodbye to someone that you've shared so much life with? Are the things that I believe in capable of taking me through the end? What do I regret? What have I done that will outlive me? That's a powerful set of questions. And then 70s and 80s. Does anyone realize or care who I once was and what I used to do? How much of my life can I still control? Because sometimes in that age range, we have to give up driving or hand over financial decisions to others. 
Is there anything I can still contribute? Why do I find myself becoming more angry and irritable more easily? Am I ready to face death? When I die, will I be missed or will people be relieved? These are very powerful questions and there's so many of them I didn't have an opportunity to put them in your notes but if you email me at this email address, if you want to copy the questions, I'll send them to you, just so you know what questions you should have asked in the last decade or what questions <laughs> <laughs> you need to ask in the next one. See, Paul had been exposed to a much bigger picture of who God was. But he understood that he wasn't there yet. That's why he uses that word yet. I'm not there yet. Yet is such a hopeful word. It, it, it doesn't require you to be in denial about what's happening right now, but it doesn't require that you give up on what's possible. There's just this amazing little word, yet. He said, I'm not there yet. He didn't think he'd accomplished or achieved everything that he was supposed to, but he uses that word, yet. He sees a bigger picture, and that's the direction that he's heading. And he refuses to believe that all there is to life is only what he can see. Because if all there is to life is what we can see, we're going to be disappointed and we're going to be fearful. We're going to think that I thought there was more than this, and that's disappointment. Or maybe we've done pretty well and we're afraid we're going to lose some of it. And that'll make us fearful. And Paul says, forgetting those things. Wouldn't it be great if you could just selectively forget some things? Wouldn't that be great? Just kind of go in. There's, there's some experiences in our life we would just like to eliminate, just kind of uh, take out of our memory. But Paul isn't talking about the painful things here. He's talking about his successes. A lot of us are so dominated by the pain of a past memory that we allow it to control our present and our future. The painful things you've been through have also brought some wisdom into your life. I honestly believe that God does not cause the painful things in our life, but I believe he can redeem the painful things in our life, and I think he can teach us amazing things in those painful moments. And that, those memories actually help make us wise and give us something to share with others so they don't have to go through the same thing. It's a very powerful thing. So big picture living. I know you're anxious. I'm already 13 minutes in and you haven't filled in the first blank. And you're saying, you, you started hopeful and, and there were only three blanks this morning. And now we're 13 minutes in and we haven't filled out the first blank. And all I will say is we haven't filled out the first blank yet. Okay, so. Uh, big picture living includes cultivating your character. Are you becoming a person whose words and whose actions actually resemble each other? You know, we often think about big picture as what we can get as opposed to who we can become. What kind of person could you become over the next five years, 10 years, 20 years? When we decided to follow Jesus, we understood the first most important truth, and that is he always accepts us as we are. That's absolutely essential. But the second most important truth is that he never leaves us as we are. He wants to grow things in us. He wants to establish things through us. He wants to build things and, and around us. He does Incredible things in and through our lives. Those who walk in grace and follow Jesus start seeing themselves differently than they used to. <clears throat> and they actually start seeing others differently. And they see uh, uh, all the brokenness in our world differently. If, if you've been following Jesus for very long, when you see the brokenness in our world, it will break your heart, not just make you angry. We think character is all about rule keeping. When we see brokenness in our world and we are annoyed at it, it shows that our character needs to be developed. Our anger will never produce the righteous life that God desires. The Bible says that. And this is the age of rant. We just keep amplifying all our frustrations and nothing is getting better. Have you noticed? Our venting does not actually improve anything. But when you see a broken world and your heart is broken by it because God's heart is broken for it, then you have options to exercise that you never considered before. 
Your character is not just what other people think about you. Because we can manage impressions. We, we can present ourselves in certain ways and we can limit the amount of time we spend with people so they don't see too much of us. But our character is who we really are under pressure and when we're going through painful things. And that can be an incredibly disappointing self-discovery process. Under pressure, we say or do something that we didn't see that coming. And you should know God wants to bring that to the surface and then he wants to build us so that we have different options to exercise. For our character to be developed, God has to do a deep work in us. And what I will tell you is, it is far easier to try to fix the problems in our world than it is to address the problems in us. But this is a deep work, and we're going to have to let God do it. And that will not happen unless you have a bigger picture. If, if your picture is just about how good a rule keeper can I be, then you're going to be like the Apostle Paul. It's going to be very unsatisfying. And you're going to become a very frustrated, angry person. But if you let God develop your character, it changes everything. What kind of person do you want to be five years from now? Do you want to be more loving? Do you want to be more truthful? Or how many times do we fail to consider joyful as part of our character development? You know, when Paul writes to the Galatian church and he identifies fruit of the Spirit, he's telling us what this character development looks like. And he starts with love. And then he goes, the second thing is joy. And peace and patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. These are all things that God wants to build in us. So how does that happen over the course of the next five years? Well, we need to allow God to do a deep work in us, which is going to require us to give some attention to that. Character won't always get you. Developing your character won't always get you what you want. It's the, character development is not about pleasing yourself. Character development is about pleasing God. It's a very different thing. So, uh, big picture living includes cultivating your character. And big picture living includes clarifying your calling. Clarifying your calling. At some point, you need to have a sense that God is giving you direction that redirects your life. This is part of our walk with him, that we're not just continuing on the way we were. He's doing something different in us and through us. And usually when we think of calling, we think of, of calling in sense of a, a religious position, title, or obligation. So I've been called the pastor. And, oh, well, that, you know, that's a calling. But when you look through scripture, you find out there's lots of examples of people called into religious leadership, but there's also lots of examples who, of people who were called to do other things. Nehemiah was a person who rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem. That was his calling. Or how about Daniel, who was called into government work? Yeah, just see how excited you got right there? <laughs> Please, God, don't call me to government work. Uh, Luke was called to be a physician. See, a lot of times we think that God only does his deep and significant work in rooms like this on days like this. But the truth is that he wants to impart something in each and every one of us that we can carry to all the places we go so that the grace of God extends out until it finally covers this entire world. That means that you are called. And, and here's the thing. I wish I could tell you that exactly how God will call you. Uh, I, I know my father's calling the ministry. He, he doesn't share it often and probably less than a dozen times that I've ever heard him talk about it in his whole life. It's very powerful and very personal and my calling didn't look anything at all like that. And I've talked to, to missionaries and their call all looks different. And, and why does God do that? Why not just have one way? Please understand this. God does not all call us the same way and he doesn't all call us to the same thing. He talks to us in ways that we understand him, and everybody doesn't respond the same way to the same call. So we have to allow God to do a unique work in us, and then we have to learn to trust that what he is doing is of him, and that the picture that he's presenting will be enough to move us forward in our life, even if we're facing difficult circumstances. And here's a wonderful thing, is that your calling can actually be affirmed and confirmed by other people. Now, I've, I've been moving through the, the uh, different decades uh, myself, and uh, it's just what happens. You know, everybody talks about not liking getting older. It still beats the alternative. You know, there is, you know, just think about that. It really isn't another option. And 
at this stage in my life, one of the things that I'm enjoying is that when I see a younger person who's engaging in their calling and I acknowledge it to them, I can see that in you. And you're making a difference. And I think it's fantastic that you're, you're following God's direction that way. That is so affirming to a person. And you don't have to be an old person like me to pull that off. This is stuff that we can do for each other. And, and what's true is that often our calling aligns with our gifts, which leads us to our last uh, uh, statement here, and that is big picture living includes developing your gifts. Big picture living includes developing your gifts. Our culture just tells us that you can be anything you want to be. If you just focus and work hard, you can be anything you want to be. That is an American doctrine. It is not a biblical doctrine. You cannot be anything you want to be. I will never be an NBA player. <laughs> it's not going to happen. I will never play in the NFL. I could train like crazy, and the first time somebody hits me, I will be in traction for the next six months. This physical frame was not designed for that kind of sport, all right? Turns out, golfing doesn't work so well for me either. <laughs> when I pull the club back, I swear even God doesn't know where the ball is gonna go. <laughs> He's up in heaven going, we'll see, I don't know. <laughs> so I'm not gonna be Tiger Woods. I'm not gonna be LeBron James. I'm not going to be whoever it is in football. I, I, I tried to think of a Bills player and couldn't think of anybody I wanted to be. But <laughs> no, no, I'm a Bills fan. And admitting you have a problem is the first step to recovery. So <laughs> the Bible talks about spiritual gifts, and it doesn't provide an exhaustive list. It just gives us kind of insights into all the different and multifaceted ways that God can work through our lives to make a difference in our world. Our gifts, these abilities, these talents, these enablements that God places and invests in us are the way that God's grace is shared in our world. And uh, a lot of times we struggle finding these things, but there are some things to look for, some clues. For example, what kind of comes natural to you? What are some things that when you do them, you, you tend to see decent results from? Um, what, what tends to change when you use your gifts? Like I said, you can't do everything. And you can't be anything you want. But you can be what God created you to be. And he didn't create you by accident. Our challenge is, is that we are always impressed with someone else's gift. And we want to be like them instead of like who God created us to be. Just, you should know this today. Please hear me. You are not an accident. You might not have figured out exactly what God is asking you or calling you to do or gifted you to do, but that just means that the adventure of figuring that out is still in front of you. God hasn't called you to be anyone else. He wants you to be you because he has a plan for your life. So, so here's the thing. You don't figure that stuff out by just wandering or or letting life drift by you. We have to have some intentionality. And the Apostle Paul uses some pretty powerful words here. He uses the word strain and press. I mean, these are, these are words of, of effort. He's, he's, he's putting some intentional effort behind trying to figure out what he's here for and what he's supposed to do. And he understands that when he does that and he pursues this big picture, that he has a different kind of equilibrium, that, that when life knocks him down, he doesn't lose his balance. He can get back up again. And, and, and he, he, what's really fascinating is that when he goes through adversity and suffering, he doesn't make the wrong assumptions. See, when you've got a big picture and you're understanding the giftings of God, it doesn't exempt you from difficulties in life. It's just that when those happen, you see those things differently. It's a, it's a very different thing. You don't assume that there's something wrong with you or that God's not who he said he was. When you have a big picture 
and you're operating in a sense of calling and you're letting God grow your character and you're using the gifts that he's invested in you, you make a different set of assumptions when you're facing difficulty and that set of assumptions enables you to continue on. That's a huge thing. There's, there is nothing meaningful that you will ever pursue in life that will not be met with adversity and difficulty. This is the world we live in. And when you try to do something good, I wish I could tell you that the world will always pat you on the back or applaud you. It's simply not true. But please know, this is how our world actually is influenced by grace. God is growing something in you. God is gifting and calling you. And when you move forward in that, not only is your life transformed, the world around us is too. Let's bow our heads this morning. The lyric of the song that we sang just a few moments ago, walking around these walls, I thought by now they'd fall. And we get tired and we start to worry that nothing's ever going to change. I would just encourage you today, spend some time in conversation with God. Spend some time reading scripture, start noticing the things that he tends to do in your life that makes a difference around you. Start paying attention to his work in you. And what you will discover will be enough to fuel your passion and fire for living through any decade you are able to get through. And our world will be better for you. Our world needs you. God has a purpose and a plan for your life. Why not spend some time finding out what that is? Father, help us trust in that incredible, hopeful word yet. We don't have to pretend about what is. But that doesn't mean it controls what is to come. We trust you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand this morning.